Good afternoon, everyone, or evening, I guess. We're at 7 p.m. now. Um, welcome to Soissons Park Solar Community Meeting number two. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off here um, by starting out with some introductions. Um, my name is Lily Friedman. I am a Community Development Specialist for the URA and Project Manager um, for this solar project. Um, I will also pass it to my fellow panelists here helping us out today. Um, I guess, Paul, if you want to start out. Yeah, good evening. Paul Martinchik, Engineering Manager with the URA. I'll hand over uh, Charles Hudson with the URA. Charles, you're muted if you want to just unmute. My name is Charles Hudson, and I'm a business strategy officer with the URA and have some experience working in uh, renewable energy in a previous position, and I'm an engineer as well. So uh, good to be here with you. Thanks, Charles. Um, and Matt, I will pass it to who? Who's um, Matt? Yeah, Matt, why don't you go ahead? We've got Matt from the councilman's office. Sure. Hi there. My name is Matt Singer. I'm Chief of Staff to Pittsburgh City Councilman Corey O'Connor. Thanks everyone for taking the time to join us tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. Um, we've also got Daniel Grantham here. Um, Daniel is the URA's um, Executive Operations Coordinator and he does all the tech magic um, that's making tonight possible. So thank you, Daniel. First glad to be here. All right, we can go ahead to the next slide. A couple housekeeping items before we get started. So um, for folks joining us on the call, you will note that your microphones are muted. Um, and we are requesting that comments and questions be held uh, until the end of the presentation. Um, at that point, we will take questions for folks who are raising their hand um, and we'll take those questions live. Um, so until then, keep your question um, handy and, and save it for the, for the rest of the end of the presentation. All right, next slide, please. Okay, well, let's run through the agenda real quick for today. Um, so welcome and introductions. We've got that all taken care of. Um, we can talk through in the next slide, meaning purpose. We're going to go over a timeline for the development here um, as we project it today. Um, we're also going to talk about, this will be a little bit of a review for folks who were on the last meeting, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about an overview of the RFP process, what can you, you can expect moving forward. Um, we're going to be introducing our community steering co committee, which I'm really excited about. It's going to be brand new for the URI. Um, and I think that folks listening in will be excited to hear about that as well. Um, then we'll talk through the RFP itself, what can be expected within it, um, as well as talking through next steps. And then that's when that community question and, and comment section will be um, where we're asking that folks hold their questions for that number eight on the agenda. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so why are we here, everyone? Um, so we're here today to learn about what can be expected in the upcoming Swiss Sound Park Solar RFP and also learn how community feedback has helped inform the process. So um, we were thrilled to have a huge response on the community feedback forum after the last meeting. Um, and, you know, there are definitely ways in which we've taken that feedback and already kind of made some decision based on what, what the community has has shared with us. So we'll talk through a little bit about that feedback um, as well. And um, yeah, so that everyone can understand like why it's so important for, for everyone to be a part of this process um, moving forward. Next slide, please. Yeah, so let's get right into it. Um, some of the feedback that we heard, um, first of all, and this was mentioned in the last meeting, we also got a lot of comments related to um, the concept of having trails underneath the solar panels um, or kind of the carport style as some of you folks refer to it as. Um, and so since you know we heard a lot of that, we kind of took that concept to our engineers and we just wanted to let you all know that 
um, you know, that can add kind of some significant costs to the installation. Um, we don't anticipate that, you know, developers will be interested in responding to something like that based on the um, significant costs that would add and what that would kind of mean for their bottom line to um, respond. In addition to the significant cost um, addition, it's also kind of a huge liability to have folks underneath the panels. Um, and so, so I, I think that, you know, I just wanted to mention that based on all those comments, we definitely did consider it. Um, and our, our engineers kind of helped us understand that that won't be feasible for, for this project here. Um, we also had less than eight respondents of the total um, that responded to the feedback form uh, did not like the solar concept. So those are really great numbers for us to understand, you know, folks, Folks seem to be excited about it, seem to be, um, you know, excited about the concept of clean energy, cleaner air. Um, so these are all things that we heard, which, you know, make us feel like the community is generally in, in agreement with, um, you know, some of the, the this kind of cleaner, greener direction that we're encouraged to um, potentially develop on, on this site. Um, I do want to read this one quote from um, one of the feedback forms that we received, because I feel like it really highlights exactly what, what our direction is for this site and where we're coming from. Um, so someone from the community said that they're very concerned about climate change, they welcome the idea of the solar development, loving that would it would be on a former brownfield rather than prime farmlands like it is um, in too many utility scale, scale solar developments across the country. Um, and really what I, I want to highlight here is the hope that this development can become an example of the best way to do large scale solar in urban areas. And so I think that, you know, that's really the goal here is to use what we're doing on this site as a way to be a model for um, hopefully, you know, mun municipalities all over to see how we've kind of converted this former brownfield into solar, um, you know, in an urban location is it's something that we haven't seen in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, it'll be brand new here, and, and we hope that other folks can kind of learn what we from what we've done here um, and really, you know, scale up the opportunity that we have for cleaner energy in this region. Um, next slide, please. So a few other things that I wanted to highlight here. 78% um, of respondents want to see the legal trail access from the existing street grid. Um, so we did get some comments of folks who have concerns about it. Um, we heard worries about um, folks kind of like the break-ins that occur sometimes at the um, commercial parking lot. We've heard some people are worried about that coming a little bit closer to their neighborhood um, where they live. That was one concern that we heard, which I think is understandable. Other folks, you know, have felt like having biker, haven't had the best experience with bikers who have kind of come right next to their property. Um, and so that was also a concern. Um, I wanna try to highlight kind of both sides of, of what we heard here because we did, you know, that 78% doesn't, doesn't highlight everyone, but um, it does appear to be the majority. So that's something that we'll definitely be keeping in mind moving forward. Um, we also heard a lot of comments about the tree canopy, um, which, you know, I grew up by Frick Park myself, so I can definitely relate um, to just feeling, you know, like people really care about the trees. And I, I totally, um, you know, empathize and agree with that. And so what we've heard is protecting the mature, the mature tree canopy, especially wherever possible is definitely what people want to see here. Um, we've also gotten comments about planting na native wildflowers and grasses among the panels to support local pollinators, wildlife, control runoff. And so those are all things that we'd really love to see implemented here. Um, we're definitely hoping to take that feedback to kind of the next stage in the process, um, which is where, you know, developers will be um, responding to the RFP and we definitely will want to see you know, what their plan is for the ecology of, of this area um, in terms of some of the, the points mentioned here. Um, further, I think like one of, yeah, one of the comments at the, at the bottom here, I also think is, is worth mentioning um, because it really also kind of got to the root of why we felt like it was, you know, this is what should be proposed for the site. Um, and so someone commented here, 
you know, that it's good for the environment and combating global warming, um, turns illegally used land into a useful asset. Um, and so I think that that's really important to highlight here. Um, we did get a lot of comments where folks are kind of worried about the safety of people on the site and the fact that it's illegally, um, like folks are illegally trespassing here um, is really this, a safety issue um, as, as much as it, as it is a legal issue. It's really kind of the safety issue that we wanna highlight here. Um, and so by kind of making these trails accessible legally, um, we intend to implement, you know, safety, uh, safer infrastructure for folks to use. Um, and so I thought that that was really well stated here. Um, and once built, you know, it will have minimal traffic impact to the neighborhood. Um, so that's another point that is a reason why we're excited about this possibility is that in contrast to the housing, um, which a lot of folks mentioned in the feedback as well, you know, this will have much less of an impact both environmentally in terms of the ecology of the site um, and in terms of the traffic impact in the neighborhood. Um, so, you know, the construction period might be some, some um, increased tra traffic for sure. In fact, it definitely will be, but that will be, um, you know, a temporary kind of intrusion into the neighborhood at which point afterwards like the vehicular kind of um, maintenance traffic is is pretty minimal um so so that's another exciting reason why we felt we feel like this is a good fit for this area and i felt like that comment really highlighted um that point so uh, next slide please yeah, so what is the proposed timeline here? Um, for folks who were on the last call, this is gonna look pretty similar. I did push that projected start date out uh, to quarter two of 2023 instead of quarter one. That's a lot more uh, feasible here. Um, still ambitious, but um, I think that that's definitely what we're gonna be shooting, shooting for. Um, starting from the beginning here, we've got Swiss Elm Park Solar Community Meeting number one, which we've already been through um, for folks who joined that. Thank you. Um, and now we're here at the pre-RFP release, so community meeting number two. Um, and so that's where we are right now at the beginning of quarter four here. Um, we are planning to release the RFP by the end of the year, so you'll see that star also towards the end of community, or I'm sorry, quarter four of 2021. Uh, we usually give folks a couple months to respond to that, so we expect the RFP to close um, during quarter one of 2022. Um, we also expect to convene um, the review committee, so um, the first meeting will occur after the RFP closes and we have all the responses collected. Um, in quarter two of 2022, we anticipate the review committee shortlisting developers. So that's where um, of all the developers that re will respond, the community will pick their top. Typically we do two or three, the review committee um, will pick the top two or three um, you know, candidates, proposals, um, and that's where community meeting number three will play out. So we'll bring those shortlisted developers, those proposals to the community, um, and that's where you will have another chance to provide comments, to ask questions um, to the, the developers who uh, potentially would be doing the work on, on this site. Um, so that's always a really exciting community meeting because a lot of times developers kind of have more visuals, um, which we don't always have the capacity to provide. Um, and it can really help you kind of understand what it's gonna look like on site. So um, that's definitely something to look forward to. Um, and then we'll come back again in quarter three. So um, for a pre-final design community meeting. So at that point, the review committee will have chosen a developer. So like the top, developer of the two or three that were brought to the table in um, the third community meeting and will be returning to the community um, to for that developer to represent, you know, their um, proposal in hopes that they kind of took the feedback, constructive feedback that they heard um, from community meeting number three and kind of changed their proposal a little bit to better meet community need. Um, and desire. So that's that's quarter three. Um, and at that point, you know, we'll be in 
pre-construction mode with the developer um, with, as you can see here, the targeted project start um, almost a year later. So um, that is the proposed timeline. Again, pretty ambitious to get us to that 2023 start date, but we think we can do it. Um, and I will go ahead to the next slide now. Thank you, Charles. Um, so yeah, what does the RFP process look like? So this is something that the URI we find is kind of like amorphous and um, you know confusing. And so I wanna take the time to kind of hash this out um, and, and really explain um, for folks who maybe weren't on the last meeting what this looks like. Um, so a development request for proposals is basically the URI, you know, requesting developers or development teams to submit a proposal to redevelop publicly owned property. So we've got two parcels in question in Swissome Park. Um, and th those are the parcels that we're going to be asking folks to submit a proposal, their redevelopment proposal um, for, you know, how much solar they think they can do there, what you know, some of the ecological concerns they're going to bring to the table. Those types of things will all be what we'll be looking for them to um, inform in the RFP. There will also be, um, you know, a number of, of other items. So the proposal might include project narrative, their experience, qualifications, um, budgets, you know, their community engagement strategies. So that's really important for you guys to understand is we like to see developers who know how to engage the community well, right? And so, so that's something that we'll we'll want to see before we even bring that shortlist to you. Um, also, a P four narrative, which will describe you know some of those ecological um, factors that I mentioned, um, as well as MWBE and MWI narrative. So again, with the acronyms, I know we at the URA do too many of those, but. Um, MWBE is Minority Women Owned Business Enterprise, um, and MWB is Minority Workforce Inclusion. Um, so those are two factors that we like to see. And I think for, for us at the URA, um, you know, an equity is inherent to our mission, and we really see these two parts of the proposal as being a way to um, really improve the equity component of sustainability. So. Um, a lot of times, you know, in the true definition of sustainability, equity is is right in there, but we want to make sure that that doesn't get lost in the in the larger vision here. So, so we like to pull that into proposals. That's something we like to see um, financial capacity. So, yeah, I won't read everything on here, but but that's typically what we like to see um, in the proposals. Um, next slide, please, Charles. Yeah, so how will a developer be chosen? I spoke a little bit to the RFP um, and review committee timeline. So I'm gonna just give a little bit more information here for folks. Um, the development RFP review committee um, is will be selected to essentially help the URA make an informed uh, recommendation to our board about you know, who we wanna select um, to you know, move forward with their, their project, their proposal. Um, and essentially, the review committee helps compare proposals based upon the submission. So including this, the concept budget timeline, all the items that I met that I mentioned on the last slide will be compared, evaluated. Um, and ultimately, it's the review committee that's going to select the most qualified developer um, and the best project for the space. Um, so typically, we include um, you know, a number of representatives from either a community organization, always the elected officials office. So some, someone from Councilman O'Connor's office will be included. Uh, we like to include the Department of City Planning um, and URA staff, of course, um, will all be helpful here. Um, we will be collaborating with um, Grant Irvin for this project. So we're hoping to pull him in as the city's chief resilience officer. Um, to bring some kind of expertise to the table here. Um, so that's that's typically, you know, what we do to fill the review committee. Um, in this case, you know, in Swiss Elm Park doesn't have kind of a, a registered community organization or RCO um, like some other communities do. So I think that that's, that's part of the reason why we're really interested in this um, community steering committee concept. Um, 
So next slide, please, Charles. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry, one back. There we go. Um, so yeah, how will community feedback be reflected? Um, and you know, we've we've done a, a number of feedback forms. We'll have another one for you tonight um, for you all to fill out. So again, we really appreciate your your help with those. Um, and essentially the other route that we're going to go for this project um because we don't have you know that registered community organization like we do sometimes in other neighborhoods um is we're going to convene something brand new for us a community steering committee uh it's something that we haven't done before but we're kind of you know excited to to really give the community a, a different kind of voice in, in this process than maybe we've we've ever done before um and so we had a number of people reach out after the last meeting with interest in volunteering uh, to be on, you know, some type of community steering committee. And so we have uh, collected who we've heard from so far, um, but we also wanted to do another call for folks. Uh, so we didn't want to leave it just to people who happen to reach out for about it. Uh, so in the feedback forum, if you want to be a part, if you are interested in joining that community steering committee, um, please fill out the feedback form with your information, contact info. Um, some folks, you know, said that they'd be interested in the last form, but we didn't have the contact info, um, you know, section on there. So we may have lost lost your um, your info there. So in this forum, please be sure to include that um, and. We'll post the the link to the feedback form in the chat for you. Um, but yeah, please please let us know if you're interested in joining. Um, and at which point we will, after this meeting, um, you know, collect the names and ha hope that the steering committee, community steering committee, can kind of self organize um, to help us kind of help guide the process here, um, help collect other community feedback. Um, and really with the goal of to nominating one or two people to sit on that review committee um, that ultimately will determine, you know, which proposal we move forward with. Um, so, so that's, that is the goal. Um, and yeah, I think the, the hope is that the, um, whoever is nominated to sit on the review committee will be speaking for that community steering committee as a whole and some of the decision making within that body, um, rather than as their own interested party. Um, the same way, you know, we, we anticipate the councilman's office as an elected party will be speaking for their community. Um, and so, so yeah, that's, that's something that we're really excited to kick off here. Um, and we hope that, you know, folks would be interested in, in joining in on that. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so to the, to the meat of it. So what can be expected in the RFP, right? Um, we've, we've gotten some survey work done, um, and we have confirmed that the two kind of flat areas there that the arrows are pointing to, which we um, anticipated would be like, you know, the perfect area for the solar um, is about 15 acres of, of land. And so what we will deliver in the RFP is, um, you know, the developers will be asked to write their proposals for those 15 acres, um, a flat remediated land for solar developers. So the remediated portion there is to to show that um, you know the remediation effort it will be covered by the URA, um, so that will be done you know prior to the the solar panels coming on site. Um, so so that's kind of the um, the product or land that will be delivered to the solar developer. Um, so that's one point that we've definitely hammered out since our since our last meeting with you all. Um, we've also gotten confirmation from the survey data that the rest of the two parcels that are in question here, um, you know, the total of uh, acreage of those two partial parcels is 70 acres. So um, of those 70 acres, 15 will be set aside for the solar. And as discussed, that's that kind of flat part there. Um, and the remainder of the site uh, will be set aside for a Frick Park extension. Um, 
So a lot of the kind of like heavily wooded trails, we got a lot of questions in the comments about kind of the railroad pro property um, and some of like the, the trails, the biking trails on the hillsides and, and whether those will be kind of on the table for solar here. And, and they will not, right? So, so it's 70 acres is a lot of land. Um, and that is, it's really just the 15 acres that are flat that are gonna be reserved for the solar here. Um, do you see some questions in the chat? Just a reminder here um, that please hold your questions till the end and then we'll be calling on folks when they um, raise their hands here. Um, so moving right along, uh, the developer's responsibility to build the access road into the site. So, so nailing down, you know, what is the URA's responsibility here? What is the developer's responsibility? We are going to be asking that the developers um, build the access road into the site. And this is a really important piece that I know we're going to get a lot of questions on tonight. And I just want to be very transparent in that where that access road is gonna be is something that we um, are still working to nail out, nail, nail down by the time we release this RFP. And that's one of the main factors that we're really hoping to get feedback from you all on tonight. Um, it will also be in the feedback form that you'll receive um, a link for in the chat. So um, just keep that in mind as, as we're moving forward here. Um, the last thing that we're going to um, definitely be laying out in the RFP is the possibility of engaging the city of Pittsburgh's power purchase agreement um, as an off taker for a portion of the electrical load. Um, so yeah, we got a lot of like really smart questions about solar and, and that definitely had me kind of having to do some research. So I just want to say thank you again to everybody who, you know, filled out the forum and was really thoughtful in their responses. Um, and this was one that, you know, was a suggestion from the community. And, and when we went back and met with um, the city of Pittsburgh and Grant's team, you know, we, we determined that we would definitely like to see um, the city of Pittsburgh power purchase agreement as an off taker for some of this load. And so that all depends on the marketability of the, you know, the power that is produced here. So if it is, um, you know, cheaper power than some of the power that we're getting, then there is a possibility that uh, the power purchase agreement could take all of it. Um, so again, that kind of op opportunity will be laid out in the RFP, um, you know, depending on the kind of price tag for the power that is produced. Um, so that's another thing that we're, we're really excited about, um, the potential to be able to essentially power city buildings um, with energy that we're producing, green energy, clean energy that we're producing in the city um, is kind of that really like full circle approach to, um, you know, sustainable cities that we're, that we're really trying to achieve. Um, so that's something that we're excited about looking into. And so again, you know, it's just an example of how um, this community process really helps us kind of improve the development opportunity that's happening here. So um, next slide, please. So yeah, how can your feedback inform the RFP? So I alluded to this on the last slide, but um, some of the things that we heard in, in the feedback, um, we heard a lot of feedback about the potential for the road, um, the access road to be built in from commercial. Um, and that was proposed initially for the housing development that was previously proposed for this site. Um, and we heard a lot of feedback saying like, you know, that essentially the tree portion here. So um, this area that's kind of coming along, I, I have option one there, but just kind of below there, you can see kind of a heavily wooded area. And so that's where the access road would have been coming from. Um, and at this point in time, we've really taken that off the table here. Um, so we heard a lot of comments about, you know, the tree cover that's there, mature trees. Um, and it really didn't make sense, you know, like to the community, to, to the point of, you know, a lot of the comments we received is that it, it maybe was on the table for the housing development when it would have been a permanent, like accessible road for pedestrians and bikers and all of that. But really like we are only gonna need this road um, for kind of a temporary use during the construction period, right? And so I think that, you know, for that kind of 
six month to year period of, of construction. And again, those are just estimates. We'll be looking to, to the developers to tell us exactly how long that period will be. Um, you know, that's when we'll need to use this road, this access road. And after that, um, we don't anticipate needing kind of a, a, a heavier duty road to get into this site. And so for that reason, it really didn't make sense to disturb about an acre of trees is what was estimated would need to come down to make that happen. Um, and that's, again, something that we've really taken off the table at this point um, in the process. And so, so that's another way that we've incorporated community feedback into some of the decision making here. Um, and so moving forward, that leaves us with two options um, for the access road. And so that's where we're kind of here tonight to see um, you know, we really want to get community feedback on, on what should be in this RFP as, as the route. Um, and so we've got one option number one here is the nine mile run trail, um, which comes off commercial as well. Um, there will be, you know, it will need to be um, made a little bit kind of safer, wider in certain points. Um, as well as kind of the, the first, for those of you who frequently bike in the area, kind of the first um, trail up towards the slag and the flat areas from that nine mile run trail that's very steep. Um, that is essentially the, the route that we would go um, for the, um, the access road into that kind of like upper um, flat area. And so that obviously for, for trucks to use will be made much wider, much safer. Um, and after that kind of temporary use there um, for the construction period, you know, those wider, uh, safer trails will really be, um, you know, an asset for, for the community to use to kind of bridge the two areas in a way that's a little bit safer. Um, and so, yeah, that's based on an initial conversations that we've had on our engineers and set with our engineering team. Um, so that's, that's kind of one, one pathway that we could go. That's number one here, which lay, which is laid out. Um, and you can see it kind of goes along the existing trail and then it would it would come up to that flat area. So that's number one. We've also got number two here, which is off of Goodman Street. Um, so this again would be a temporary traffic um, through the neighborhood. We, we wouldn't have to take down, you know, this would be minimal trees coming down um, as would really both options. Um, and so that's another possible outlet. Um, you know, it's really the question of kind of temporary um, closure to the trail access there um, or kind of additional traffic through the existing street grid. Uh, so those are, those are kind of the two options that we have after eliminating really that, um, that access road being built to kind of save the tree cover um, along uh, you know, the existing trail. And so, so that's what we have now. And that's really some of the feedback that we're looking to, to get from you all. Um, next slide, please, Charles. I just wanted to highlight some of the comments we received that really helped us um, understand that that trail from commercial, um, you know, wasn't the best pathway. And so I think that I just wanted to take a moment to um, read this. And this is, it's really, one of the comments was, uh, I think it's a bit silly that access wouldn't come off Love instead of commercial. I don't really see an issue with that as Love Street resident, assuming access is in frequent post-development completion. It would be unfortunate to destroy the lovely natural areas to appease a few. So that was one comment. The second was a lot of deforestation and regrading of the hillside in order to support work vehicle traffic seems very counterintuitive. I would not be supportive if there's an access road built through the heavily forested hillside or was very disruptive to the nine mile run trail. So that's some other feedback that we heard um, that helped us kind of eliminate that option. Uh, for folks who are like in favor of the Love Street access point, um, Goodman is the better route for us to pick here just because of some of the turns that would need to be made um, coming off kind of like the main throughways uh, to get to Love Street it's a little bit less um, of like the turning radius necessary to get through Goodman is a little bit less, which for, which for uh, some of these larger vehicles is, is safer and is going to prove to be kind of the better route. Um, so I just, I did want to mention that. Um, next slide, please. 
Okay, question and discussion. I know I'm about five minutes over what we talked about. Um, so I will be quick here, but um, next slide, please, Charles. Um, so I just want to run through kind of how this is going to play out. Um, oh, one of our images didn't come through here, but um, so yeah, how can you provide feedback and ask questions? So tonight, what, how we're going to run the rest of the meeting is we are going to ask that folks use their raised hand feature um, to indicate that you would like to comment. And so we're going to be taking questions, comments live until 8 p.m. Um, and then at which point after 8 p.m. we'll be responding to only questions in the chat. So I know that some have come through through the chat already. Um, and at this hey, point. Uh, Lily, if I may. Oh, yeah, please go ahead, Daniel. Take it away. Um, if, if you wouldn't mind putting your questions in the Q&A versus the chat, uh, the chat just is difficult to manage when there's a lot of questions Q&A. Uh, will be more helpful to getting as many questions answered as we can. Thank you, Daniel. Um, all right, I am also gonna grab the feedback form link um, as we're pulling the first question here and put that in, in the chat um, for folks. Um, all right, Daniel, I'll, I'll leave it to you to help us um, pick through as our first our first question and comment. I believe, um, and I forgive me if um, I mispronounce any names here, Erwin Dabreshin. I, 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 my mistake. Oh, you didn't mean to raise your hand. OK, I will lower your hand then. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to uh, Jen Damon, I do have the floor. Jen, Jen. Jen, we can't hear you if you're trying to speak. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Great. Okay. Hi there. About the two access road areas, um, first, I guess through Goodman or commercial that you're asking for feedback on. I um there, there's gonna be a lot of emotions on that. I just I don't think enough information about the scope and expectations for the traffic to be expected on those two options has been made available. The size of the construction vehicles, is it just in the morning hours? I mean, if it's a few hours in the morning or a few hours in the evening, it could be a lot different than an all day hassle. Like, I just think that would be helpful information when people are asked to make decisions or provide comments about what kind of traffic influ influences are going to be reaching into those areas. Can you incorporate that into the RFP or provide that information before, I guess, soliciting comments and comments about those two suggestions? Yeah, so I think that, um... What we are going to do for sure is we're going to ask that question in the RFP. Um, so we're we're going to be looking to hear, um, you know, what developers are planning planning for for how kind of that construction will play out um, in terms of vehicular traffic. And so that is something where we kind of intend that you know at the next community meeting when we have kind of developers that will be responding. Um, we, we hope that each one, you know, we can kind of compare the options there between developers of, of what they're saying that would look like, um, at which case, you know, then we'll have kind of real, you know, accurate information for folks, um, rather than kind of like a best estimate. Um, so I think in my mind, that would be ideal. Um, you know, that being said, I think that, yeah, we will definitely kind of make an effort to see what information we can pull on, on that factor um, between now and the RFP release. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Uh, Amanda Berry. Hi, this is um, Jason Miller, Amanda's husband. Will the RF, will the request for proposal include the developer to be responsible for the trail construction around the around the site? 
or is it only for the solar installation? Yeah, so that's something that um, we are still working out with the city, how that's going to play out. Um, we don't have an answer at that time for that question, um, but it is it is possible that um, they may be asked to kind of lead the kind of management of that portion uh, for the remainder of the site by kind of contracting out that work. Um, however, it is also possible that we may leave that out of this RFP entirely um, and really just isolate the solar sections. Uh, and so those are those are two things that, you know, that's one question that we really will need to hash out in the next month. And unfortunately, we don't have an answer tonight on that. Um, if you want to reach back out on that question, uh, I would encourage you to reach out to me, my email um, and you know, as soon as we kind of have a sense of the pathway there, um, I'd be happy to, um, you know, keep folks updated who are interested in, in how that plays out. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Here's my email on the screen. Um, so feel free to reach me there. Also, my work line is there. Um, which forwards directly to my cell phone. So it's another good way to reach me. Um, and I'm happy to follow up there um, once we kind of have that nailed out. That's definitely one of the questions I was hoping to have um, nailed down by, by this meeting. Um, but the way negotiations are playing out a little bit there, we, we, didn't we, don't, we haven't come to consensus enough to kind of share it publicly at this time. Uh, next step is Paul. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, I was going to comment on the trails. Um, yeah, you know, ahead, as, for those who are active there, I mean, there's a there's a very mature network of of trails and um, you know bike paths and things through the through the area now. But as we get into the to the detail of the site, as we look at our remediation plan, either what interruptions there are to that to those trail connections. Um, we're going to look closer at how we're how we reestablish those that connectivity, and then also enhance the connectivity, you know, from the from the various you know areas and access points, you know, as we as we move forward. But mostly, we're going to work with that existing uh, network and you know develop out from that. Okay, our next step is Paul. Sable? That's it. Uh, I, uh, Paul, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, I have like two two different comments on this. Uh, one, uh, I'm going to, at the 2023, um, you know, there are also going to be construction starting in the area for the commercial street uh, bridge re replacement. And that's going to be a two-year project till 2025 is slated, you know, right now on PennDOT. So uh, there's already gonna be some uh, additional traffic coming into that area. Uh, most of the traffic, uh, you know, coming into Swiss Elm Park, the best route in is pretty much forward down to commercial because the the other routes uh, through Swissville and stuff like that uh, probably aren't uh, as large of roads. Uh, I know there's some buses that run through the, the park uh, Swiss Elm Park and stuff along that line. And I would assume, you know, the construction vehicles are going to be a similar size to a Port Authority bus uh, coming in uh, and transversing. But some of those other residential streets, uh, you know, when you go to Whipple and down uh, to Goodman and stuff along that line, you know, trying to hold that, those uh, vehicles can be, particular, you know, really particular. Um, and also, like you said about Love Street, you now Love Street is a one-way street for the one portion, so they would have to go down Philander or whatever to get to that, um, the other two-way section of Love Street. But uh, on that plan, I don't know if multiple sites would have to have, uh, access points would have to be there because there's like probably about three different plateaus in that area. Um, you know, the, the plateau that's kind of like on the height of Goodman and then further down, there's another plateau that's lower down on like off of Love Street. And then you go up again off of uh, on Adago, there's another plat you know, uh, plateau up there. So access to that site might require 
more than just one road um, and things along that line. So just there's with access to the site, extra traffic coming through for PennDOT, just want to make sure that uh, you're, you know, you're talking to uh, PennDOT and coordinating things because the community is going to get a double hit um, for that two year, your at least a year plus project uh, for the solar panel and two year for the uh, bridge construction. Uh, so I don't know if any, any thought has been on that. And then I have a second question. Yeah, maybe we'll do your first question first. Um, so we are definitely coordinating with PennDOT. Um, we've met with them. We are kind of staying in touch as it, as it comes down to their kind of construction timelines and ours. You know, it's something that we'll definitely be coordinating with them. Um, they reached out to us at the very beginning of their planet planning process because um, part of their construction will fall um, kind of like on top of URA land, essentially. Um, so, so we have been in coordination with them and it, it's something that we will continue to coordinate. Um, as for multiple entry points to the solar, um, I think that, you know, we're planning to only have one entry access road. Um, to do two would mean that we would have to go both options um, that are were provided previously in the PowerPoint. Um, and I think that we really want to try to limit it to one of those disturbances rather than two. Um, however, if folks feel differently about that um, in the feedback form, please feel free to um, to write that in the comments that you would prefer to have it split among two options. I would encourage people to um, really, you know, explain what would be best for you uh, if that if that is a route that you would prefer. Okay, thanks. Um, the the second question I'm going to put on my other hat that I wear. Um, uh, that the hat I wear uh, on a daily basis is uh, uh, work for the city of Pittsburgh EMS. I'm one of the district chiefs, and uh, that uh, particular site that, you know, URA, you know, with the trails that are unauthorized, even though they have a extensive network built there, um, every once in a while we do get uh, uh, people uh, injured on those trails. So it makes uh, it very difficult for us to get into some of those areas. And so that's kind of maybe my hat to throw in the ring that to, if we had a different access point besides Goodman, maybe on Love Street, you know, or something on that line uh, that we could get to those areas better. Um, because uh, when a biker goes down, people don't know where they're at and it takes us a long time to just try to find a person um, because, uh, you know, inevitably somebody will say they're in Frick Park, they're on Nine Mile Run and, uh, you know, just trying to pin them down is, is difficult. Um, I know some, te some technology that the county has worked on that we have will actually help locate somebody and pinpoint them. But, uh, you know, even still getting through the area is tough. So if that area is, you know, redone with uh, some bike trails, I'd like, like to see some better access for emergency vehicles to get into there. Um, if somebody is sick or injured. Got it. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, my point earlier to us having one access route was really related to the construction vehicles, but um, I think it's definitely worth considering, um, you know, how to make these kind of existing entry points to Frick Park from the street grid um, available for safety vehicles. Um, that's that's definitely something that we want to consider um, and we'll will be yeah really really looking to understand um, you know that safety perspective as a way to build this project as kind of an amenity for the community so I, I definitely appreciate that comment and I, I think it makes a lot of sense yeah Paul thanks for those comments um, with the safety and and um, that'll be worth considering is you know how how far in do we need you know need to make, reach um you know the safety kind of vehicle to get in there you know so that yeah we we have a you know whatever say an opening at the streets but you can only get in say 50 feet and then you know your you know 12 1200 or whatever or another quarter mile or whatever that is to actually get to somebody you know how do we how do we strategically make that access to to get as close to 
you know, most of the site as you can. Good, good comment. Yeah, the, the one thing is we had two incidents uh, off of Goodman Street that we had to respond into, and we were almost to the to the point where we were overlooking Duck Hollow. Um, so we were almost to the end of like the, the plateau um, where we had uh, people in, and a lot of the access uh, initially is by foot. And then we got some other like gators in there and stuff like that. Uh, the park rangers came up and used some of their vehicles to um, get uh, uh, equipment and personnel closer to the scene. So again, uh, it's, um, it, it, is, it is an issue when something happens back there. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Barry, did you have another question or did I just forget to lower your hand? I should probably let you speak so you can respond to that question. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, hi, thanks. I had a, another thought. Okay. Does, will the proposal discuss how the utilities would be run through the site? Like I imagine for solar, there's going to be you know, new power lines or new infrastructure that has to run through. And I didn't know, you know, I know there's an existing power line that runs along Goodman, and I don't know if that's the connection point or if there's going to be new utilities run across the site. Uh, that will be the connection point uh, through the Goodman Street power uh, lines that are already existing. And, and there's no thought to modify the existing lines that are there, maybe put them underground or do anything along those lines? No thought, no, none at this point. Um, it hasn't been something considered. Okay. I just thought that, you know, that it just as a thought that if we're if they're in there doing work, if this is the time to upgrade some of the infrastructure utility access, that might be the time to do it. But all right, thank you. Thanks. Uh, username Jen and Aaron. Hello. Yep, Jen and Aaron. <clears throat> Jen and Aaron here. Um, we uh, we live in Swiss Home Park, and you know you guys have done a great job explaining these options and. One thing we were thinking about is, you know, the traffic through the neighborhood for an access point like Goodman Street is, is temporary, but um, for the trail access point, any deforestation is permanent or, you know, more so. Um, takes a long time for trees to grow back. So what kind of permanent deforestation or um, any kind of changes to the landscape would we see um, through that kind of access point? Yeah, so the access point through um, the nine mile run trail, like that option um, is really, we actually went and walked it just recently um, and it's it's fairly minimal. Uh, so there's one area um, that kind of slopes up very um, steeply. And so that's where we're really gonna have to do some earthwork to kind of remove the existing hillside to build a wider road. Um, there are some kind of small trees and shrubs in that area, um, but it's definitely nothing like kind of the larger mature trees that we see, um, you know, in the other sections. It's, it's if, I'm sure you're familiar with the site, but there's, there's a lot of kind of like smaller, more weed trees. Um, and we do anticipate that some of those will have to be removed. Um, we don't at this time have kind of a sense of like the number of trees, um, but we, I imagine like based on kind of the walk that we did that it, it'll be much less than like half an acre um, is kind of just my, my sense off of just walking to it. Um, but we, we don't have those numbers kind of like in hand to present right now. Um, but it's something that, you know, once we define our route is when we'll um, start diving into having like a, a more, like a stronger number to present there. Um, I think we're, we're kind of waiting to define the route. And once we do that, we'll have a better sense of exactly um, what trees would need to come down to make it happen. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have an exact answer for you, but it's definitely one that we're going to be working to get um, in the next couple of months. So. Uh, 
Um, next is uh, Erwin, uh, you have the floor. Well, um, let's go ahead and pivot to, we've only got uh, one live or one unanswered question in the Q and A, and I'm gonna check the chat real quick to make sure we didn't miss anything there. Um, this question is from Susan. Uh, the initial, after the initial construction is complete, how much noise will the new site create? Yeah, so we expect the noise to be extremely minimal. Um, and that's, I think, one of the exciting things about the prospect of this um, development is for us is that, yeah, we, we really expect it to be very quiet. Um, the maintenance vehicle, like, is going to be kind of, you know, a small vehicle. It will be infrequent, you know. Um, and so I think that, yeah, ongoing post-construction, very quiet. Um, is, is how we understand, um, you know, things will play out. So uh, we think that that will be, you know, a benefit for the neighborhood. Um, we've got two questions in the chat from Chelsea Burkett. Um, the first question is, um, who else will be on the steering committee? Yeah, so we haven't um, fully, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Daniel. Well, let's, let's do one at a time. Um, so we haven't fully formed the, the review committee yet. Um, and so I, we don't, we won't have that answer for you yet, but like I said, I mean, it will be representatives from the councilman's office, URA representatives, um, representatives from the city, including, um, you know, Grant Irvin's department, um, if not Grant himself, I think we're interested in, um, we're, we're interested in seeing kind of who comes to the table for the community steering committee um, and who will be involved in that. Um, I guess maybe that's what you're referring to in this question now that I'm seeing it. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that I don't have the full list of names in front of me right now. And again, we'll be hoping to, to get more names here, but you know, if you're interested, um, I would recommend sending me an email. And once we have the fully list formed uh, or the full list formed, um, I'd be happy to share that with you. Really, I have a follow-up question, if I may. Please, Daniel. So when we talk about a community steering committee, we're talking about people directly in impacted or in proximity to the project site itself, correct? So it's not like someone from uh, uh, like Perry North is going to volunteer and get on the committee. It's gonna be people in the immediate area, correct? So community is a very loosely defined term. And so how I would respond to that is by saying, if someone from Perry North is like a mountain biker who uses these trails every day and has like a heavy stake in what they wanna see happen to this property, um, then I would say that they should respond and say that they wanna be included. Um, we're not gonna exclude folks um, based on residence or anything like that. Um, so if if you have if you're a stakeholder um, that cares about this space, then you are eligible to be on the steering committee. Um, and I'm glad you asked that because actually I was flying for this meeting in the neighborhood over the weekend, and somebody asked me, um, you know. Like, oh, I just rent in this house. Like, should I still come to the meeting? Does my voice still matter? And I just want to say to folks who are wondering that, like, absolutely, yes. Like, you know, you don't have to own your home in the neighborhood for your feedback to be important. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that point as well. Perry North was the first neighborhood that comes to mind. <laughs> or I don't know why. I think, I think it was just thinking about a neighborhood that was far far afield of yeah. a Swiss home park in Squirrel Hill. But yeah. uh, 
And Thanks, yeah, Lee. I mean, my, my dad's a biker and he tells me that, you know, those trails in Frick Park are known nationally. So, you know, who knows who, who might be interested in these parks that are, that are coming to Frick Park to, to do their biking. So. <laughs> okay, the next question Chelsea had, and I think we may have covered this in the presentation, but it bears um, clarifying. Will there be a separate RFP for the remediation? And will the ecological restoration components of the project be done as part of the remediation or later and by whom? So I guess that's kind of three questions. Yeah, um, okay, so let's start with the first one. Will there be a separate RFP for the remediation? Um, and the answer is no there. We actually already have an engineer um, who, we have contracted with that is going to be helping us with the remediation effort. Um, so that part of the equation has already been um, confirmed. We, we know the engineer that we're working with for that part of it. Um, so you could, so no, you shouldn't expect a separate RFP down the line for that. Um, will the ecological restoration components of this project be done as part of the remediation or after and by whom? Um, so I think that this part of the question, we don't have completely ironed out, but I can tell you that definitely, yes, some of the ecological restoration components will be done as part of the remediation. Um, so uh, typically, like what, how we think it's going to play out, and Paul can probably speak better to this than I can, but there's, there's a cover, um, a ground cover that will be kind of put over the the slag, which you can really see visibly on site. It's kind of that rocky area. Um, and so that, that ground cover um, will be part of the remediation effort. And then often there's kind of like a cover crop that will be put on top of it. And so we anticipate some of that to be done in the remediation effort, which the URA will be managing through our work with our engineer who we've already contracted with, um, A. And then B, on the solar section, um, just in initial conversations with solar developers prior to even um, moving forward with this conversation as part of kind of our due diligence on the front end of this, um, you know, folks who are developing solar have um, like a full team that kind of covers the um, ecological kind of like planting and native planting and, and that type of thing that they do beneath the solar panels. So I anticipate that part one of that um, restoration, ecological restoration effort will be done during the remediation, but I anticipate more to be done by the solar developer themselves um, on the areas that will be covered by solar. Um, so I, I guess I would say both um, and by, by both the engineers we're contracted with and the developers responding to the RFP. Um, Paul, I don't know if you want to add anything in there or if you feel like I covered it, but feel free to jump in. Uh, yeah, just to just to um, add to what Lily said, you know, we're, we're currently working on working with the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, the DEP, on just what the um, remediation requirements will be. We're revisiting our risk assessment. You know, originally that risk assessment was run for, you know, an intensive um, you know, a residential neighborhood, whereas now we're switching to, you know, recreational and to, you know, in a, you know, a lower use, uh, lower exposure kind of um, recreation, and then also the, uh, the solar, which would just be pretty much not occupied, and it would be uh, maintenance. So looking at that, the other things that have changed since the original, original development concept and the original remediation plans is the, um, the evolution of the city stormwater requirements, and um, you know, so those have those have been reshaped, and a, a certainly more emphasis on, you know, stormwater retention, detention, and um, so we'll be looking at that in, in this in this design as well. Um, so there will be, as, as Lily said, you know, uh, you know, the original plan would have been, you know, a lot of lawns, a lot of you know, perennial type of plants, um, trees, obviously, but you know. Um, more, more like streetscapes and, you know, lawnscapes and things, whereas now we're moving more towards that, you know, ecologically, it'll be uh, more of a native species plantings. Um, again, replenishing the, you know, forest where we can in this development, 
Um, just so, so we're looking at those options, but we're still kind of in the development phases on that remediation plan. And I, and I do, I do, I will say that as we, as we parallel the solar development, we'll also um, reach out to the community, to explain what's going on in the remediation end as well, and um, you know, keep a public face on on what those plans are and what those look like. Yeah, and I would encourage folks, so when we get to the process, part of the process where we have our next community meeting where these developers will be um, sharing their concepts with you, I would encourage folks to bring these questions about ecological restoration to the developers then um, and really try to push them on their efforts here to do kind of native planting and, and, and do what they can for um, for that ecological restoration component, because we'll really be hoping that the developers can bring some, um, you know, unique and exciting opportunities to the space in that regard. Um, so right now it's kind of like been taken over by a lot of weed trees and plants. And I think there's a real opportunity there to have more native um, planting in, in that 15 acres than there are now. And I mean, personally, that's something that I would like to see, so. Um, our next question is from Jen Damon, and then we'll go back to live. We didn't get as many questions as we did last time. It was literally question. There was like 80 questions. Uh, so uh, the eight o'clock thing is kind of out the window. Okay, no problem. We don't need to do it. Uh, so we great. can go back and forth. Um, so Jen asks, with these roads, will the URA have a plan to keep ATVs and other motorized vehicles out of the area? The large boulder at Goodman, which I'm now re realizing is a literal boulder at Goodman. I was like, what is that? Did the job very well, but motorized vehicles and hikers, walkers, and cyclists are dangerous methods. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, so there's gonna, we, we definitely need to do some thinking around, you know, pull in folks who are. Um, much more kind of intelligent about safety and, and focused on it than we are to make some of these decisions about the plan. Um, and so we don't have a plan now for that, um, but I totally agree that that's a safety hazard. Um, and it's definitely something that we're gonna need to think through um, as we are defining the trail access points um, versus you know the kind of truck access or safety access points and, and navigating some of those questions down the line. Um, I think, you know, we're definitely going to have to, to, to figure out, you know, how we can um, ensure to keep other motiv motorized vehicles out of the area. Um, Cause I know that's, that's been an issue is, issue now. And, and I hope that with some of the minds that we can pull to the table in terms of, you know, Trail Pittsburgh and other trail folks, um, as well as kind of the safety arm of our stakeholder group. I hope that we can figure something out there um, that will, you know, make it safer for, for folks who are, who are utilizing the trails for recreation. So, so yeah, we don't have a plan to share now, but it's definitely something that we'll be interested in pursuing. Yeah, I also think with this being, this will be a um, city park, so um, motorized vehicles would be barred. Okay. Yeah. Um, back to uh, live questions, uh, Mr. Barry. Um, yeah, this is Amanda. Um, oh. uh, the access road, I just wanted to clarify. Um, I, I have been assuming the access point would be the same for both the remediation work and then for the um, solar panel installation. Is that correct? So um, ideally, yes, we're, we still need to hear more about, so like Paul said, we're, we're um, kind of getting new results back from some of the studies that we're doing um, for the DEP to understand what exactly that remediation plan is. Um, ideally, uh, yes, they could be both, um, depending on the areas which we need to remediate. Um, we may we may need to use use both of them rather than just one of them. Um, so, so I think 
to give you a more concise answer, we're, we're not 100% sure yet. Um, I think ideally we can use just one route, but it will be dependent on some of kind of the safety and hazard studies that we're doing for the DEP to help us define what the remediation meet, plan needs to look like. For the feedback form that, you know, for the feedback you're looking for then, is that specific to the kind of like solar panel development access or? Yes. Well, okay. So we don't really have input on the access for the remediation work. Unfortunately, that's something that the DEP kind of need, like will mandate. So it's not something that the community can decide or the URA, um, you know, if, if the DEP um, for example, like that kind of steep part that comes from nine mile run to this like flat area where the solar is, there's a lot of exposed slag there. Um, and the DEP may mandate that we cover that to a certain extent. Um, and if the road, you know, comes from Goodman instead, then we will have, we will likely have to come um, from nine mile run regardless of whether we want to or not to, to make sure that those areas are safe for the public prior to um, allowing folks to legally access it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not something, I mean, I'm interested in, you know, what you think about it, please feel free to comment on it. Um, however, it's not something that we have like free decision-making power for because the DEP will define what does and was does not need to be remediated. And it's our responsibility to get to that section um, wherever it is, you know, in as a prerequisite for us being able to allow public use on the site. Okay. Lily, that DEP, the state or Pennsylvania's Department of Environmental, Environmental Protection, Protection, correct? Yes, thank you. Sorry with the acronyms, I know. Oh. Um, and then we have one additional question in the Q and A, and then it doesn't look. I mean, unless there's other questions, I think that's it. Uh, what is and this is from Chelsea Burkett. What in the community outreach plan, or excuse me, what is the community outreach plan ahead of the meeting with RFP respondents? Um, this seems like a very important meeting and I would hope to see additional advertising within the community. Um, so what um, so what we're hoping to do is to really have the um, community steering committee. So so I guess, yeah, let me talk through that a little bit more and how it's going to play out. So Everyone has the form um, in the link here. Everyone has until the end of the month. So you'll see on the screen, remember the deadline, November 30th, 2021, to fill out that form. Um, at that point, we will be, um, you know, kind of convenient, like getting the list of folks together um, who are interested in being on the review on the community steering committee. Um, and that's really where kind of like the communication I think will happen. Um, between now and the next formal meeting. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that once we convene that, that group, you know, they can kind of act as a liaison between the community um, and the URA. Um, and so I think that that's kind of where the engagement, um, it will be directed. Um, so, so I think that I will leave it there um, other than saying that, you know, we intend to do kind of similar outreach um, to get the word out for the next meeting, the third meeting. Um, we've done flyering the, around the neighborhood. We've shared on our, through social media, the website. Um, I also will mention that we're hoping to, um, to pull together a list of folks who are even like interested in hearing more about this project. Um, so you'll know on the feedback back form, there's a place for you to leave your contact info if you just kind of like want to be on the um, list to you know, get information about this project. And so I would encourage folks to fill out that part of the feedback form as well. Um, and then when we have, you know, as soon as we have the flyer for the next community meeting, you know, you'll get an email to you. Um, and so that's another way that we intend to um, do outreach for kind of the next community meeting before that occurs. 
Um, so I hope that that answers your question. I don't know if anyone else on, on the panelist line um, wants to share anything there. I think, Matt, I'm not sure if you had anything you wanted to add. Sorry, I was looking for my unmute button. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, again, ideally, after the community steering committee is up and running more, I think that word of mouth communication will have a lot of value, but also for continued meetings in the future, we plan to flyer, keep putting stuff on social media, just making sure that we can maximize coverage of notification. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Lily, are you, are you done with that response to the question or? I am done. I thought, I thought it. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to like jump right in there. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, Daniel, thank you. Uh, uh, that regaining my train of thought, uh, Paul Sable has a follow-up question, or not really a follow-up question, it's uh, unrelated to his previous question, but is there uh, safety measures in place to protect the public from hunters who use the area? I'm interested in hearing, are there people hunting in Nine Mile Run? Yeah, this is a, a problem that we are really struggling with. Um, oh so gosh. there was actually a deer um, that was shot in Nine Mile Run, I would say maybe um, a month ago at this point. And so uh, our property was on the news. We, were on call we had calls with the forester. Um, it's something that we are it is definitely on our radar. It's been difficult for us to enforce without having folks on the ground, um, you know, patrolling the area. Uh, there are signs up everywhere. Um, we have issues with folks tearing down our signs. Um, so it's some. It's it's definitely a challenge for us. It's something that we are extremely against in every way, um, and we are trying to, you know, figure out kind of a, a strategy to to make sure it doesn't happen. I think that. Part of what we, um, part of like, th that is another part of, of why we think that this development um, will hopefully, you know, solve part of that, that problem as well, is because, um, you know, part of it will be fenced off and patrolled, um, you know, and kind of monitored by the solar developer. Right. And so that's a large portion of the site. And the rest of it will be a formal Frick Park extension, um, which right now folks are trespassing on it. So I think there's a little bit more of like, oh, you know, it's not going to be patrolled. Maybe the city forester isn't really walking through that area because it's not city land. Right. Um, however, you know, if it when it does become public use, we're kind of hoping that the um, traffic will scare, scare people away a little bit more. Um, and again, like we'll we continue to put the signs up. We'll we'll do what we can on our end as property owners. Um, but it, it is definitely a challenge that we're we're open to any recommendations on um, how to keep people, you know, from doing that. It's it's kind of it's been difficult for us, similar to um, the bikers who are illegally trespassing on our land. It's a safety issue with them too. You know, we we have the signs up, we have the no trespassing signs. And people tear them down. They don't. They just pull them down. Um, so it's it's definitely something that we're um, we're aware of. We know it's an issue, um, and we're working to combat it in the ways that we know of. Um, but I think it's something that we definitely um, are hoping this development and you know scaled up use for the site will help kind of scare folks away from that. Um, so I guess I'll leave it there. Oh, that is surprising. I once was hiking in a national park and called the park ranger and said, there's someone hunting here. And he said, well, you're not allowed to do that. This is a national park. And I was like, well, that's why I called you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Right, right, exactly. It's, like, it's surprising, but it's not shocking. To hear yeah, and it's definitely, it's hard to, um, yeah, like we, folks were like, are you going to press charges? And we were, re we were willing to, you know, at the URA, we were ready to press charges. They couldn't identify who did it. Um, but 
I mean, we're, we're willing to take kind of the punitive measures against folks. It's more of that it's difficult to catch people doing it. Um, and it's also, I mean, to the same point that was made earlier about the safety, like when someone calls and says, hey, there's a hunter in Frick Park, right? It's really difficult to know where they are, how to get to them. And a lot of times they're gone before we can kind of identify them. And so again, hopefully having like more standard, like more um, official trail markers and access points and that type of thing and ability to get on the site uh, can hopefully help us kind of get to these offenders faster and maybe be able to provide a little bit more enforcement of the rules on this in this area. Um, so, so yeah, definitely an issue. Um, looks like our last question here is from Mike Roth. Uh, I am wondering what happens to the land in 30 years when the solar panels degrade and it's time to replace or remove them? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's one of the exciting things about this solar development is that it is a more temporary use than the housing, right? Um, we will have a chance at the end of that like 40 or 50 year period of the lease um, to reconsider whether we want to um, go for another 40, 50 years, kind of bring in new panels and, um, you know, if it if it's a if it's working well, maybe we'll stick with it. Um, and if it's not, then we might, you know, there might be options to do something else on this site. Um, and at which time, you know, the since the URA will still own the properties, it would be very likely that a similar community process would happen, although probably with like much more enhanced technology or something crazy. I don't even know. Yeah, it's hard to imagine what a community process will look like in 50 years. I'm sure it will be quite different than this. Um, but all that to say is that we don't have a plan for after this lease at this time. Um, but I think, you know, an evaluation will happen where we kind of determine whether this has been working or not. Um, and based on that, you know, either continue or renew a lease or go a different route for the site. Um, is there any other questions, uh, either live or in the Q&A, there's none in the Q&A. Last call for questions, essentially, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, um, Lovely, let's talk next steps. Yeah, great. Um, so, I just want to reiterate to everyone, please fill out the feedback form. Um, please, you know, give us your contact info if you want to stay kind of informed about this site. Um, that will be kind of a resource that we'll use to get the flyer info and meeting info out to people sooner than, you know, the flyers in your mailbox even. Um, and yeah, please let us know if you're interested in joining the um, community steering committee. I think that's something that we're really excited to be, you know, piloting with um, with this community for this project. Um, and yeah, my contact is on the screen. Uh, Paul's as well. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you know you didn't get your question answered tonight, um, or you didn't feel comfortable posting it um, or saying it out loud. Please feel free to reach out to us um, individually. We'll get back to you as soon as we can um, and you know we're happy to kind of continue by by keeping folks updated who are interested in some of the questions that we didn't have perfect answers for tonight um, there was some that i was really hoping to be able to get covered tonight that we're not quite there yet but again if you have some of those questions please feel free to reach out to me and we'll keep you informed as soon as we have more information and that's really all. Just thank you all so much for joining in. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the panel has any other final comments. Oh. Okay. Well, appreciate you spending your evening with us and have a great rest of your night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye. Great job, everybody. Great questions.